The podcast is supported by our colleagues over at the American Center, New Delhi. And as Rose mentioned, we've had some wonderful events with the folks over at Wild City. Today's event promises to be equally exciting. So I'm going to hand over to Medha Onyal, our moderator for the day. Medha heads Pratham Institute, Livelihoods Organization of Pratham. She's been working on testing and scaling new solutions to skill youth and increase women's participation in the workforce through vocational training and entrepreneurship support at bottom of the pyramid. Pratham Institute has provided skilling to over 120,000 women and men and supported over 2,500 women to start their micro-enterprises. Medha is passionate about gender, labor, and jobs. She also writes about these issues for publications including the Stanford Social Innovation Review, The Guardian, and Indian Express. Over to you, Medha. Thanks a lot, Sanakshi, for the introduction. A big welcome to everybody joining us today for the chat. A big thank you to the America Center for hosting us, to Women in Labor in Wild City, for putting together this amazing lineup that I'm personally selfishly very excited to chat with. Uh, we have three brilliant women here, and we're going to be talking to each of them, one after the other. So keep your questions coming in the Facebook comment section. Um, you can ask them directly to directed at one speaker, or it can be for the panel in general. So let's jump right in. Um, today, we're talking about reimagining children's literature for a new generation of women. It feels like I was a child a very, very long time ago. And it feels more so to be true uh, when I look at all the shifts that have happened in literature. There's been progress that's happened and major shifts that have happened in the stories that are told and the people that are represented in our stories. And we have with us three women today who've been at the forefront of pushing some of these boundaries. We have one speaker today who speaks of subjects that are considered taboo in children's literature. We have another who's taken storytelling for children beyond the written to the oral word. And we have a third who's been archiving stories of real life inspiring women um, and making them accessible to children in regional languages as well. So I'm really excited to have everybody here. Um, the three speakers will also be reading excerpts from their published and unpublished work. And these are wild, brilliant pieces intended and directed at children. Um, I think they're enjoyable for adults. I think over the years I've realized that I enjoy children's books significantly more than adult books. So I um, hope all of you enjoy these excerpts as well as much as I have when I've read them. So just a quick context about why we're here. Um, I think everybody knows books, movies, television, basically all kinds of consumption that we have. They influence us deeply, knowingly or unknowingly. Um, I personally remember when I was growing up, um, I was stuck between when I was trying to find books that I wanted to read. I was stuck at two ends with two ends of the spectrum. At one end, we had um, sparse Indian literature. And depending on how old you are joining in, you may remember Amar Chitra Katha, Panch Tantra and so on. While very interesting, I think they primarily dealt with a lot of Raja Rani stories or of anthropomorphic animals. And at the other end of the spectrum, you had a lot of fairy tales, um, which were about either a princess losing a shoe or eating the wrong apple or just generally waiting for a prince charming to rescue her. Um, some of you may agree, uh, a lot of the women that we saw in our literature didn't represent the women that we knew in our lives. Uh, whether they called it so or not, um, a lot of women around me, I could see breaking, subverting stereotypes, uh, breaking glass ceilings in different ways and just fighting everyday battles. They may not have called it uh, so, but they were doing so. And our literature very often didn't reflect that. As I started growing up and as I started visiting places and reading more, I remember um, when I was in college, um, I went to Madhya Pradesh and I visited this school. It was a beautiful school in Khargaon Zilla, I remember. And uh, on the walls outside were uh, graffitis of trees, of animals and of poetry. And one of the poetry that I remember stuck with me, just one line was, uh, Ram cricket khelta hai, Sita khana banati hai. Um, very, very small example, um, but very indicative on the walls outside of what literally happens inside schools as well. Um, school books I've seen are very often not very different from what we just spoke about literature and children's literature. Um, I think some problems are fairly unnoticeable. So when you see pictures of cooking happening, you'll always see bangles around the hands. When you see pictures of fixing of cars and fixing of fans, they're typically pictures more of men. Um, some cases, the examples are a lot more prominent. For example, um, there's a 
there's a researcher who studied and analyzed textbooks, for example, in West Bengal, and, and you can see these all over. These were textbooks which were history and geography textbooks. And they saw that 76% of all pictures illustrated were of men, 4% were of women, and the remainder were animals and other kinds of illustration. The 4% picture of women, pictures of women that we saw, were either women carrying piles of like uh, water or of women picking tea leaves. You see these stereotypes play out in all kinds of ways. Um, even in math textbooks, which aren't sort of left, there's a group called the Friends of Education. They studied primary textbooks and they saw that on an average, a primary textbook has anywhere between 115 pages to 130 pages, 80 to 100 illustration. The same thing again, um, you see all engineers, money lenders, shopkeepers are men. Uh, the only women that come in are the ones uh, teaching, the teachers in saris uh, with other women. Um, and so you see this pattern repeat over and over again, um, sometimes very occupational, where even chapters like how do people earn don't have any representation of women. Very often this can be problematic, especially in the formative years of girls. I think when we're growing up is when we develop a sense of ourselves, a sense of how to act, how to think, and most important, how to aspire. Um, and these very often when you don't see yourself reflected in them, it can be very, very difficult for girls to develop a sense of self and ambition, especially sometimes when they're not encouraged inside their homes. They need to see not the preachy textbooks saying you can do it, but just seeing girls who are rebelling a little. Um, so I think um, not to make it all pessimistic, I think things are broadly changing. We see a lot of girls um, not just being ambitious and, and sort of doing all the right things. I find stories of the naughty girls most exciting. I think we're seeing a lot more of those as well. Um, we're seeing a larger diversity in our books as well. We're seeing all genders or different sexualities. We're seeing different castes represented in our books increasingly. We're seeing difficult subjects being spoken about. We're seeing disability, adoption, and so on. Things that I know my friends really want to see in their books as they have young children growing up. And that's been really exciting as a change. To me personally, I quickly end with an example of when I realized in a quick lesson that I learned about why representation is so important and also the quick shift it can lead to immediately. Uh, when I had joined the organization that I work at, Pratham, I remember I had visited a small town in Maharashtra called Ahmednagar. Uh, the work we do, typically we try to provide vocational training and skill development to young people so that they're able to access jobs. And I remember uh, we had a student, uh, we had an electrical training center that I visited. There was a workshop that was going on. There were 60 boys uh, who were working on a, a, a panel and one teacher who was a woman teacher, female instructor, who was teaching all of them. And I was really impressed. I went to her and I said, this is amazing. You're a female teacher. All of these boys are listening to you and like you have their attention at your command. Um, and I remember um, asking her, why don't you bring more girls into our program? And she reprimanded me. Uh, she took me outside to our training center's board. She showed me that the pictures that we had on the, the, pan on the board outside were all of men doing electrical work. She pulled out our pamphlets and she said that all the pictures that you have over here are of men. How do you expect girls and all the people who talk about your program are men? How do you expect more girls to come in, even with me at the center, to ensure everything goes smoothly? And that, I remember, was a startling example. Um, to be honest, uh, we changed that quite immediately. And I wish we'd done that much earlier. And we saw quick shifts. That center last year trained about 100 uh, women electricians. Um, and we've seen these examples all over. Um, I remember in another program that we had that we did with the United Nations Development Program, we sent out these videos of what you can do to different villages. And one cohort of villages, a cluster of villages, received videos of women automotive mechanics. And we suddenly saw an increase in enrollment into the mechanics.
Hi, I'm just going to um, jump in. I think we've uh, lost Meda um, when she, uh, I think there's just been a uh, bit of a glitch. But um, in the meantime, I would love to um, introduce you to our first um, storyteller. Um, Mandavi is a cre creative director and media entrepreneur who uses innovative storytelling to spark meaningful change. Um, she's currently leading a range of independent projects for brands and individuals alike in the capacity of a curator, creative director and brand strategist. One of these projects is Aplam Chaplam, a multilingual storytelling channel for Leher India and a Delhi-based uh, child rights protection NGO, which she created to cater to urban underprivileged children in lockdown. She also continues to pursue work as an independent artist and is due to have a series of original children's books published this, later this year. Mandavi, if you would um, like to share your story with us and then we'll have a quick chat about it. Hi. Sorry, I think my internet is... Sorry. Thank you, Sarah. And hi, Neda. That was an amazing opening. Actually, I feel like you've covered everything we want to talk about today. Um, I was not expecting to have to introduce myself. It's hard to distill. Uh, I'm essentially a writer at the heart of everything. And uh, I hope to be able to do things of value to my community, to my intimate community, my larger extended community, and see um, how I can sort of be true to myself in making uh, the world a more exciting, imaginative, wonderful place for children and everybody else. So yeah, I think that's the only way I would want to introduce myself right now. I'll quickly add to that because Manu is clearly being very humble. She's the founder of uh, Homegrown, which is a, a forum and a platform that all of us have really looked up to. It's sort of spoken about, uh, has changed the way you talk about youth and how you talk about themselves in urban India. Uh, she's also now a creative director consulting several organizations, including a project that I'm really, really personally fond of, Apalam Chaplam, uh, which is storytelling for uh, young children. So Mandrovi, uh, over to you to sort of uh, narrate what you have for us. Okay. Thank you so much. That was very kind of you. So today I'm going to be reading. This is a first for me. I'm extremely nervous. So please excuse any <laughs> sudden pauses and nerves in this entire narration. It's a children's story that's very close to my heart that I wrote almost five years ago. And uh, yeah, I hope that you like it. It's called The Boy Who Spoke to Machines. I once knew a boy who could speak to machines. He'd roll up his tongue while he stared at their screens. He could make static sing, make televisions dance. When he walked through a room, things turned on by chance. And you might think such skills would make others green. But machine friends can't speak, and the people ones were mean. His lonely little language and his quivering eyes made the other boys fear him, so they spread terrible lies. He's odd, they said cruelly. He has friends made of metal. They'd beat him and scald him with water from kettles. Then they'd call him a monster when the boils began to rise. And they'd try other tricks while they waited for his cries. But the cries never came, not in front of those boys. Machine Boy's father, you see, always hated that noise. So he'd learned early on not to sniffle and quiver. He'd just play pretend games where he'd drown in the river. And his friends still want flesh. They were metal and wire. They were only cold toys to fix and admire. So the boy I once knew who could speak to machines, he didn't again because the others were mean. He hid in black cloth and put plugs in his ears. And when no one was looking, he'd shed a quick tear. They called him a pervert. They called him a queen but still no one saw that which couldn't be seen. Then one day, a circuit lay burned on the floor and try as he might, he could ignore it no more. He fixed it so well, it made him a wolf cub and with each button he pushed, he felt every snub. The cub grew quite large, it howled soon and roared, but it always stayed close to protect him, it swore. So he still went to school and he seemed quite the same, but when alone with his circuit, he'd found a new game. 
He made more cube cups from his board that he'd found. Their bodies knew strength, their loyalty no bounds. The boy he grew taller, the wolves no more tame. Because even born of squalor, they had cured him of shame. Now he's all grown up, but still hides in his den. And when he steps out, there aren't any men to pick at his scabs and his odd little ticks. They're too much in awe of his incredible tricks. He travels the world now, making machines come to life. And the magic in his fingers, it seems to end strife. He makes walls crumble down and blue oceans turn red. He makes moons go quite bright. He turns diamonds to lead. The broken boys like him, he gives them butter and bread. And if they're still torn apart, he can sew them with thread. And his wolves howl out loud for the return of the dead. Because machines, you see, they did what he said. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> really beautiful, Mandovi. Thanks a lot for sharing that uh, with us. I know it's an unpublished work, but it's really, really beautiful. Yeah. Um, if you could just take a minute to talk about what led you to writing this and did you, while growing up, see gaps that led you to wanting to write something? Absolutely. Uh, uh, it's actually a very personal story. It is uh, very much based on someone I've known uh, very intimately. Uh, and it's, I think the theme is somewhat around, uh, you know, the pressure and the expectation of gender constructs that exist. And uh, in this case, for a little boy who is constantly told that, you know, to be a man, the usual tropes, which are still so prevalent, you must be tough, you can never cry, uh, and his family, with his friends, uh, a lot of bullying, a lot of unnecessary shaming for being different and, uh, you know, for being a little bit more effeminate, perhaps, for being more sensitive in some ways, for liking odd things. So uh, what was really, it was heartbreaking to see how all of that manifested and seeing him kind of grapple with all of that, but also very, very inspiring to see how he then channeled, uh, you know, the trauma, the shame, etc. Um, into so much success and I don't mean just uh, of the, you know, the career kind or the material kind, though he's done plenty of that as well and it's very impressive, but um, more as a human being and he managed to turn what everybody told him was his weakness as a young boy into, uh, you know, big strength and uh, he used it to give back and make sure that others did not kind of do the same thing and I think that's a story that's universal and that everybody can relate to, uh, especially, you know, kids who grow up and got sort of uh, at the margins and not able to kind of have that voice when they're younger. So yeah, that's uh, pretty much it. That's amazing. So I think you spoke to two things that I feel quite strongly about as well. One is um, books, of course, for women to promote that, but also to talk to boys about the gender roles that they are confined with. And that's really interesting. I also like that you mentioned um, that we, there is a need to also talk to, to children at, at the margins. Um, books at the end of the day are sometimes unaffordable. Um, a lot of content in Hindi and English exists, but also in other languages is needed. Um, so can you also talk a little bit about what you've been doing with Aplam Chaplam and um, the idea of sort of taking storytelling uh, beyond text, which is sometimes not accessible to everybody, um, to also uh, an oral word? Yeah, uh, that's, I mean, you've covered it beautifully. Uh, essentially, that was very much where it came from. Uh, it is a project that was born all of one month ago, genuinely, <laughs> during lockdown, um, out of a need or a desire to kind of change currency from all just, you know, donating money, which kind of leaves people feeling dissonant and disconnected sometimes. And I think largely people really do want to help in a way that it comes from their heart. And uh, there's a need to kind of bring care back into the equation. Um, and when, you know, I think uh, almost all of us, uh, our hearts were breaking, kind of imagining what the situation is like. Uh, especially when, you know, you're locked down in unfortunate situations where there's no space, there's, uh, you know, social distancing is a privilege, you have no means of engagement and there's a lot of conversation always for, you know, uh, as Leher India, which is the NGO, the amazing NGO partner who uh, we are doing this with, puts it like there's food for the body, but there's also food for the mind and we often don't take that into consideration for the people living in the margins. We think that survival is all that it's about, but 
quality of life and dignity and allowing for you know for making things like leisure and imagination really something that everybody should have a right to um i think that's very much the philosophy of it and we wanted to make that accessible so um it was kind of two pronged it was a way i think i think all our contributors who shared stories uh, have had as much of a wonderful time kind of going into the recesses of their memory and uh, pulling out these amazing stories and realizing how those stories impacted them growing up uh so that's one thing and then when you put that kind of intent into something uh, i mean the feedback and the testimonials from children out in uh, you know that has been collected from the field is really quite incredible they're writing the most amazing poetry and uh, yeah it was it brought tears to my eyes actually when i was seeing that and you you realize um, i mean fiction and storytelling i'm glad that we live in this version of the world that we do today which i'm sure many people don't agree with right now but at least stories are being taken seriously and uh, i think that's a first it wasn't like that even 10 or 15 years ago and uh, we really need to give them more credence so yeah so what are your thoughts on what has actually changed in the last 10 years um, which has actually made diverse voices so prevalent in the last few years uh i think independent media is a huge one um it sort of allowed having different people kind of uh, you know the i think people realize with the internet that the barrier to entry is low and uh, it really is possible if you have the sort of determination i know so many people who've kind of done projects on the side uh, just trying to build out uh, i mean the internet really has democratized things in that sense uh, so it's nice that people feel more agency one even as artists or creators to just put their own work out there which is uh, a huge change for our generation at least and that sort of lived through that shift happening side by side with my own coming of age and uh, simultaneously i think independent media plays a huge role and i specifically say independent because i mean the mainstream has existed for a long time but from my personal experience um, you know even with homegrown which was not related to uh, children's literature as much but what it did was create a sort of space where the creative industries and young people and conversations around identity could happen and no other space was kind of catering to that and in doing that i feel it really glued together a kind of ecosystem which didn't have any structure before any form it allowed people to feel that okay i could really become a, a music producer or i could become uh you know a storyteller of some kind or um, the the feelings that i'm having about my queer identity are relevant and there are other people out there who are having that so the more we kind of have different voices i'm not saying that that was the only one that needs to exist what we really need is so much more of that and i really hope that you know the people coming out uh, in this next generation are going to do more and more of that because there is the possibility of it and before we close any last thoughts on how do we encourage more independent media how do we encourage more diverse uh, voices and what are gaps that you still see in our uh, literary ecosystem in india especially right now a uh, good question it's a hard one to close with i i think what we really need to do is there needs to be more funding for such things firstly because it takes incredible amount of energy and uh, it's a creative resource yes but we need to take that more seriously because it's just uh, it's uh, it's not easy to do no matter what kind of background you come from and uh, i think there are a lot of these there are a few projects that i can name that i think are great examples to look at uh, who have done it well like uh, you know people's archive of rural india and uh, there's of course agents of ish there's uh, there's these wonderful uh, i actually totally khabar leheria and cg net swara which are such good examples of uh, you know organizations not just saying oh we want to speak to this audience but actually building the resource of uh, making sure that the stories are coming from an authentic place and from the people who are actually living within those communities training the women to become journalists uh, i mean khabar leheria does that in an incredible way um and all we need is for people to have the hunger and the you know the dream to 
kind of go behind it and uh, I, I know it can happen. So more of that and yeah, we should all support each other. <laughs> Amazing. So I have about a ton of more questions for you, but I'm going to have to pause over here. Uh, if any of you have any questions for Mandovi, please keep leaving them in the Facebook comments. Thanks a lot for your time, Mandovi, and stay around with us for the question and answer at the end. Thank you so much. So we have with us next um, Lakshmi who has sort of been a trailblazer in her own right. She is a former investor, a gallerist, she's done, she's involved with the art spaces and she has also written a book that I've personally been dying to get my hands on, uh, which is a book of 51 um, women across history and their inspiring journeys through time. So Lakshmi, uh, over to you to narrate your story and then we'd love to have a chat with you. Sure. Um, hi, everybody. Thank you. Um, and thank you, American India Center and Women in Labor for having me here. I'm going to be reading you a story from the book uh, that uh, we've written uh, called The Dot That Went for a Walk. Uh, it was written by Sharda Kineni, uh, Rima Gupta, cre created by Sharda Kineni, Rima Gupta and I. And it's a woman as it's a book on uh, 51 vim, uh, short stories of 51 uh, women role models of our country. I'm going to be reading the story of Rukmini Devi Arundel. Um, she is a woman, I don't know how many of you are familiar with her, but um, she, I, I find her uh, very inspirational. And, and um, you know, there are so many women role models in our country that, you know, we don't really talk about. So let me read the story and then I'll talk a little bit about her. Um, Rukmini Devi Arundel, dancer, nation builder, 1904 to 1986. Written by Sharada Akineni, illustrated by Valeri Puri. When Rukmini Devi danced for the first time, people of Madras boycotted her performance. They were shocked. They found it unacceptable that a woman from a respectable upper caste family was performing on stage. But Rukmini was unafraid. She argued, dance is an art form. It should belong to everyone. People found it difficult to accept it. This dance, Sadir, it lacks grace, they argued back. This is not meant to be performed by someone like you. You're from a good family. But she persisted. She reinvented the dance form to bring it the respect it deserved. She paired the dance with classical music. She redesigned the stage. She changed the costumes and made them more artistic. She let the dying dance, Sadir, live on as Bharatanatyam. Rukmini Devi was born in Madurai. She grew up listening to her father's stories. Her father was an open-minded man who was against the caste system and animal sacrifices. Her happy childhood was free of discipline, but Rukmini learned traditional values watching her parents. Her free childhood shaped her choices, which were courageous and compassionate. She was one of the most celebrated dancers of India, but she didn't stop there. She wanted to preserve the identity of India by reviving its traditional arts. She set up an arts academy, Kalakshetra, to teach Bharatanatyam and other ancient Indian arts to people from all over the world. Rukmini Devi will be remembered for her unorthodox choices, for marrying a foreigner who was 24 years her senior, for becoming a dancer, for reviving fine arts, for being a voice for animal rights, for becoming a Rajya Sabha member, and for saying no to becoming the president of India so she could continue to build the cultural identity of India. Thank you. So, <laughs> so Rukmini Devi, um, you know, just as I read, um, uh, you know, it, it's, these are short stories, so they're only 300 words. Um, but um, this is a lady who was a visionary. This is in the, you know, 1930s. Uh, she decided that, you know, Sadir, which was a dance done by Devdasis, and, you know, as you probably know, Devdasis are women. Um, you know, devotees of God who, um, you know, dedicated their life and their worship of uh, a deity or a temple uh, soon to be sexually exploited and, you know, um, uh, you know, really ha by the end of, you know, when, when she came on in the 1920s, you know, it, their community, which was quite influential at one point in time, had deteriorated to uh, being really sexually exploited, exploited by the higher caste. Um, so she uh, came in, she saw the dance and she said, oh my God, this is beautiful. How can I, you know, how can this dance just go away? Um, and so she went into hiding and actually learned the dance form. 
and she came out in uh, Chennai and said, I'm going to do perform this dance. And people thought they're going to pelt stones at her, uh, but they just loved it. And that was the origin of Bharat Natyam, you know. And how many of us really know the story? We have heard about Bharat Natyam, but, you know, we don't really understand that, you know, there's a woman behind that. Um, beyond that, you know, that was one part of what she did. Uh, she uh, brought about uh, the, you know, she was the first woman to be a Rajya Sabha member. Um, she was also, um, you know, uh, instituted the Animal Welfare Board. So in the 1960s, um, she, and so the last 60 years, whatever animal welfare policies are born is born out of the board that she created. So, um, so there are fascinating stories like this of great Indian women that, you know, uh, we, we wish through our book can reach uh, children and really create inspiration and aspirations among them. That's fabulous. So I've read about her over the last few years and each time I revisit her story, I learn something new. Yeah. So I had no idea about her contribution to wildlife and that's just so fabulous to hear. <laughs> I can see why this is a story that inspired you most. Uh, you've also clearly dabbled in different roles. Uh, yeah. If you could talk through what was stories growing up, was it stories that you were growing up with that inspired you or were there women in your life that inspired you? But what led to sort of uh, your uh, desire to this story. Yes. So, um, so this story was inspired. By, I was inspired by the story because I was a Bharat Natyam dancer myself, and um, you know I knew about Bharat Natyam. Kalakshetra was like you know uh, we always looked up to it, but I never really went into really understanding um, the the history behind the dance. And and when I read about her and dwelled deeper into that, I think that's when you know this really inspired me. Also, I think growing up, um, um, most of our stories that we were, you know, as you rightly said, you know, we had Amar Chitra Kata and, uh, you know, and, and the other stories from the West, you know, we didn't really have stories that we could relate to, um, as, which were, you know, when, we, when you read stories, you're reimagining what's happening in the West and not really understanding what the next door neighbor or your friends are doing. So, um, and, and, you know, uh, and really the inspiration behind writing this book actually came from my daughter. Um, we are, uh, as I said, we are three co-creators of this book. Uh, we are three women, three, uh, we are all mothers to daughters. We are women entrepreneurs. And we felt that it was time to create social change through inspirational stories. And that's how the first initiative came about, which is the dot that went for a walk. And, um, you know, you really, uh, Medha, when you began, you really spoke about uh, the fairy tales. And when my daughter was, uh, she's eight years old now, when she was two, three, people started giving fairy tale books. And I used to keep them away from her because it is such a social conditioning you're putting into a girl child. Always damsels in distress. You have the Prince Charming coming to rescue you. The only aspiration you're putting into a girl child is that the, uh, you know, find a man and uh, he will rescue you. What about your own dreams? And, and so I kept that away from my daughter. But as soon as she went into school, princesses was, you know, the everything. She wanted to be uh, Cinderella, Rapunzel, you know, all the things that I was trying to keep her away. But that's okay because, you know, fairy tales does, you know, uh, there is a lot of imagination that comes in with those fairy tales. But there is also an uh, you know, unconscious bias that you're putting into that child. As long as that awareness is brought in about that unconscious bias, you're okay. So, you know, I was there to talk to my daughter and tell her, hey, you know, what about this princess? Doesn't she want to do anything on her own? You know, is the, her only attribute looking beautiful and nothing else? You know, what about her dreams? And, and as long as that conversation is held, it's, it's okay. Uh, because there are other things that the fairy tales bring in as stories. Uh, to, you know, as I said, for building the child's imagination. Um, and then uh, we also, uh, so that was like my inspiration because I, I wanted her to read stories of real women, stories, um, um, you know, as they say, if you can see it, you can be it, right? And if we can show stories of women who have achieved and uh, to these kids, um, you know, they feel that they can achieve it as well. And most of the time, we, um, it was also important that we showed different career aspirations to kids. Um, so um, 
what happens mostly is that um, you know uh, we we think of yeah as you rightly said women think of being teachers um a, a big, and especially if you go down to the rural setting uh, if if they um if they are uh, let's say if there is a school and you're near an airport the girl's aspiration is to be a teacher or work in the airport because that's all that they can see so through these stories we were hoping that we can show different career aspirations by which you know your minds are kind of uh, uh, really opening up at a very young age uh, because this book is uh, meant for kids from 7 year 7 years onwards so it's a long answer to your short question <laughs> oh, that's, uh, this is really really useful to know and it's very very relatable to me um i have friends and family and i can see them all sort of sense what they read to their kids so they're all conscious about what they buy but they're reading ahead of the text as they're narrating it to their kids to sort of block out any kind of you know um gendered connotations that exist um your point of aspirations was a really good one um i remember we did a survey some years ago um just to understand aspirations and what women are surrounded by and this is for low income women who wanted to start their enterprises and i know all of them basically said that um, all boys felt confident in their abilities and said we know people we know friends and family who run businesses and so we should be able to figure this out on their own uh, for girls we saw confidence was a very big problem because they didn't see they were first generation women entering the workforce in itself and starting their businesses you spoke to entrepreneurship earlier starting their businesses seemed uh, like a far fetched dream because they've not seen anybody do it but they've also not heard of anybody do it um your story the dot that uh, your story is basically covers such a wide tapestry of occupations as you mentioned how did you go about choosing them and what was the thought um behind occupations being selected there so when we started this process um you know we were wondering how many women can we get you know and we uh, we had more than 250 women that we had to shortlist and bring it down to 51 uh um, the way we kind of chose is that we looked at a couple of um you know ways of representing women uh we looked at nation builders uh, like kamla devi chatopadhyay ella but uh, their contribution to building our nation post uh, independence we looked at women who are uh, really propagating our indian legacies whether it is um uh, an you know a yoga granny uh, we had a uh, we have a lady called meenakshi gurukul who does um kalari paitu which is an which is the mother of all martial arts and we don't know of kalari paitu uh, which which is from kerala but we know of karate karate came from kalari paitu so the um, so how do we propagate that or a tribal healer stories of a tribal healer we also looked at women who pioneered uh, in their space so if it is the first lawyer uh, cornelia sorabji the challenges that she had to face being the pioneer um so we have women uh, from there and um, you know we have women that we we know across the various uh, professions that um, you know whether it is being a judge so we have a transgender judge the first transgender who's a judge um, uh, in order to create stories and show stories of people that you know it, it is okay to be different you know you don't need to really conform to a certain um, um, a, a certain way so we really went across everything is based on merit uh, we didn't look at uh, looking at different states or um, areas uh, even though a lot of people told us to do that we were like no we uh, so i'm actually from kerala and my other friends one is from um, who wrote the book uh, they're from uh, rajasthan and and uh, telangana so they keep saying that it's a story of kerala women because there are so many women from kerala you know it, it just happened to be that way uh, but um, it's really looking at you know um looking at pioneers nation builders um uh, various professions that as we know today we have aditi mittal in the book um as well because we said um uh, imagine a, a girl she she really is funny and she's humorous and you know she doesn't know what she can do and especially i'm talking about in a lower income family she doesn't know what she can do with that and imagine if she reads the story of aditi mittal it something happens you know we really want with these short stories something to change in their heads at that point at that age uh, because uh, typically if you look at and i and i would like i love to understand from uh, you uh, as well meeta typically a lot of the foundations go and talk to children when they are in the 11th and 12th standard but the point is that a lot of the things have already been 
you know, you need to talk to them when they are seven. These aspirations need to be created when they are seven, eight, nine. And unless you give them the power of these stories that women can do it and they have done it, I think that it becomes extremely challenging. And, and, and that's really the motivation uh, for us to look at these various professions and, and pioneers uh, and really talk about our women, uh, which we don't. Um, also, I believe that when we were growing up, uh, we spoke a lot more uh, to women, uh, spoke more about women because you had the Sarojini Naidus of the world, you had Indira Gandhi, these are women who, um, uh, who we knew about. But for, for my child, it's not relevant at all. Where do I talk about Sarojini Naidu to her? Where do I talk about Indira Gandhi to her? You know, I mean, there is no real discussion and we don't talk about role models. So uh, before we did the book, I just want to add another point. Um, my other friends who have daughters who are older, they went to their school and uh, they said, okay, they asked the boys first, can you name one or two women role models? Um, they shouldn't be in the entertainment industry. Um, um, can you name one or two women role models? They could not name anybody. There were people who were saying Kid Kardashians. Yeah, I mean, those were the <laughs> responses that we got from some of the top schools. And um, then we said, okay, sports maybe. Then they were like, okay, Mary Com is somebody that we can talk about. Uh, so there is no discussion about role models. And, and um, uh, there is a book by Adam Grant which says that if you want to be original, you need to have roles beyond your family. Typically, our role models are father, mother, uncle, you know, but we need to look beyond and outside. And that's the other reason why we wanted to bring this book out. So great to hear. So for everybody, the book is The Dot That Went For A Walk. Um, just last quickly, is there anything you heard back from people who've read the book uh, that sort of encouraged you, even if it's your own daughter? Oh, uh, so my daughter is my biggest fan. So I, I think that's the bias. So I shouldn't go there. But, um, you know, we translated the book into a regional language. Uh, we translated that into Telugu. And uh, it's a low cost edition where uh, we uh, printed about 12,000 copies of the book and distributed it in uh, government schools and, uh, and uh, um, rural areas. And uh, that's where we've received a lot of feedback, not just from the students, but also from the teachers who said, I want to take this book back home. I think that is where, you know, we felt the most joy uh, because, you know, our larger vision is that every girl um, in every government school should have access to this, these stories uh, to feel inspired. So, yeah. <laughs> I do want to say one more thing. The dot that went for a walk, um, um, you know, why we named it that, because, you know, everybody keeps asking us that, you know, what is the connection? So for us, the dot means a possibility. And, uh, you know, when you start writing, it's, you start with a dot. When you start painting, you start with a dot. What you can do with the dot is endless. And these are women who've paved their own journeys in life and walked their own path. And we are telling the kids that, what you can do with your life is endless and what the possibilities are is endless. So yeah, that's the dot that went for a walk. <laughs> that's amazing. So my big takeaway from this is that 51 stories have come out and a lot more were shortlisted. So we can possibly yeah. hope for a subsequent edition. Uh, Ashmi, so great talking to you. Um, we we'll quickly hop over to Paro and we will be back with uh, the question and answers and the whole panels. Uh, together. So thanks a lot for sharing the story and thanks a lot for the book, which is really, really exciting. And hopefully we will be able to get it soon. Thank you. Um, quickly to introduce Paro, I am very, very excited. And I have several people who've messaged me to convey to you that they're big fans of yours. The list has been growing. <laughs> and so it's a little difficult to name everybody. Uh, everybody who's uh, if you're unfortunately not familiar with children's literature and don't know the Queen Paro Anand, she's a Sahitya Academy Award-winning author who talks about all kinds of uh, difficult subjects in the nicest possible way for children and has difficult conversations with them. Uh, we've seen books and topics ranging from communal hatred to terrorism to failure, being different, sexual abuse, and whatnot. So, um, I think Paro is unafraid of talking to children like they're adults and not sort of sanitizing content for children. Um, so I will leave it to Paro to sort of take us through her story today. Paro, over to you. Sorry, I lost you for a moment. Uh, just to say, Mandovi, uh, loved your poem. 
absolutely stunning. And uh, Lakshmi, um, I've seen the book and I actually, uh, uh, talked about outside. Some of them I actually here. met uh, Rukmini Devi uh, women. Sorry, I'm getting some feedback. Sorry, my ma my audio is okay. Okay, all right. Okay. Yes. So is this going to be better? Is this oh, better, this is or should I do without the mic? Should I just take off the earphones? Let me try it. Audio is perfect, Paro. I think there was an internet. Let me try it like this. Be better. Yeah, is that all right? Okay. Uh, I think we lost you a little bit when you were talking of your relation with uh, Rukmini, and that would be lovely to. Yeah, hear. Rukmini Devi actually gave me a prize when I was a child, a prize for drawing, which is the one and only prize for drawing I ever got. Uh, when I took uh, the idea of Lakshmi's book and some of those examples to a school. Uh, talked about some women achievers and then asked them uh, to think of some women who are sort of their ideals, their gurus, somebody who they would learn from. And one boy said, my mother. And I said, why? And he said, because she gave up her career to become a mother and a homemaker. And what was very nice was how the girls fought back saying that uh, that doesn't make her a guru. A guru would have been someone who stuck on and managed to do both. Right? Um, Thank you so much. Uh, and and uh, I do want to say, Meda, that I'm also a big fan of Paro. So when you were saying that there are many fans, I also want to say I'm there too. <laughs> Thank, you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Well, I mean, uh, I think I've had the privilege of having to break a lot of barriers along this journey. And I think that I, I will happily take some, some credit that we are able to talk about some of the things that we're talking about today uh, because of the hammer and tongs with which I have been writing and working. I still have books that get banned out of schools uh, but first, I think, Medha, you wanted me to first talk about my story? Yes. Okay. I was very excited. So this is from my collection. It's called, uh, it's called I'm Not Butter Chicken, You Can't Order Me. Uh, <laughs> it's a collection of short stories. The story I'm going to read from is Bablu's Bhabi. Bablu was sad, sad and angry. It had happened again today, like every day, and he knew it would keep happening. What had happened? Well, as usual, his elder brother, Dinu, had beaten Muni Bhavi, Bablu's Bhavi. Mostly, Dinu beat her over trifles, often because he was drunk or suffering from the after effects of too much drink. Like this morning, she was carrying a pitcher of water. Dinu dropped his towel and he went as he went to the tap for a bath. He ordered her to pick it up. And as she bent down, a little water splashed from the matka onto his foot. All hell broke loose. Suddenly the pitcher lay smashed on the ground with Bhabi lying among the pieces, begging her husband to forgive her for crime she never committed.
Faro, um, if I could request you to pause, we seem to have lost you. She clutched his feet as he rained blows down on her, who drink and... Faro, we lost you for a little bit. Uh, and you're on mute right now. Where did you hear up to? Um, I heard up till the, uh, the uh, uh, bucket fell on the foot. Okay. Yes. Well, hopefully, as I said, tech moment. <laughs> there is no tech event without a tech failure. It would be an incomplete event. And it would be happening with me. All hell broke loose as a little water splashed on uh, Dino's feet. The pitcher lay smashed on the ground, Bhabi lying amongst the pieces, begging her husband for forgiveness begging him to forgive her for a crime that she never committed. She clutched his feet as he rained blows down on her and kicked her arms that stretched out so pleadingly. Bablu turned away. Like a coward, he turned away. His mind whirled, his fists clenched. He wanted to hit out. He knew he could hit out at his thin, read of an elder brother whose body had been eaten away by drink and drugs. A thousand forms of revenge raced through Bablu's mind. But like a coward, he turned away. Dino ruled their household like some sort of despot king. Bablu went to his mother and said, Amma, why don't you stop him? Why don't you stop him from doing this? And Ma would say, it's just a woman's kismet, beta. Mardi karte hai aur aurto ko sehna padta hai. Men will hit and women will bear it. And is it a man's kismet, Bablu shuddered, hoping that he would never abuse his wife? Is a man only a man if he can hit someone who can't hit back? No, I'm not going to do that. When I get married, I will buy colorful bangles for my wife. I'll buy her laddus to eat. I won't hit her. I won't be considered manly, but I don't care. Now Bhabi sobbed quietly as she washed clothes at the tap. Bablu could see the angry blue-black bruises on her back. As she carried the heavy bucket of washed clothes, Bablu stepped forward. Bhabi, Ruko, wait, let me help you. Wordlessly, she held the bucket out. And as Bablu took it, they were joined by that handle of the bucket and joined in their own misery. Bablu looked at the bruises on her arm, gently, he stroked his hand on her arm. And suddenly, as though the, a dam had burst, with that one touch of kindness, Bhavi started to weep. Her whole body shook with the force of her misery and grief. But not a sound dared this escape her lips. Finally, when she was all cried out, Bhabi took the bucket. She said, Bablu, kill me. Please kill me. I can't take any more. Bablu was rooted. He waited. Bhabi composed herself and said, No, you can't do anything. You're just a child. You can't do anything. And she took the bucket and went away. Bablu stood rooted at the spot. Something inside him had changed. He didn't know what it was. He just felt different. Next morning started like any other. Dino bathing and Bhabi cooking. 
A few moments later, as he sat down to his breakfast, Dinu spat out his tea, flinging the hot liquid onto his wife, screaming the filthiest abuses and grabbing her hair. Damn you, woman! Didn't your parents teach you anything? He raised his arm to strike. Bablu was there in a flash. He held his brother's raised arm in a vice-like grip. In a firm voice, he said, Dinu, let her go. In shock, Dinu left his wife and turned his wrath on his brother. You filthy puppy, you dare to stop me? You dare to come between my woman and me? I kill you for this. Stop it. Stop it or I'll call the police. Howling and cursing, Dinu fell on Bablu, hitting out at him blindly. But Bablu was stronger than his drink-soaked brother. He scrambled on top of him and pinned his hands down. And then, in a voice of controlled command, he said, You hit my bhabi one more time. One more time. And I swear I'll have you in jail. And then he left him, moaning and cursing there on the floor. Bhavi and Amma, they were in a corner, shocked. Pablo didn't know whether they thought that what he had done was right or wrong. He didn't care. He knew that he had done the right thing. He went to the tap, he washed his face to control his trembling. And then he said, Bhavi, give me my breakfast. I'm late for school. Bablu had become a man, a true man. Wow. Uh, I think most of the people in the audience cannot see, but uh, the rest of our panelists, as is the case with me, I'm sure we have goosebumps and everybody's slightly teary-eyed, Paro. Um, that was such a beautiful story and thank you Thanks. for sharing that. Paro, uh, it's such an interesting story that you've narrated and uh, very relevant in current times as well. Uh, we're in a lockdown, a lot of people, as Mandobi earlier alluded to as well, um, don't have the privilege of social distancing and you see a lot of kids while there's a perception that some topics are off limits for kids but kids see a lot of these topics play out in their households how do you make these decisions to have these difficult conversations with kids and what do you think kids can be doing right now through these stories um, when well I'll tell you an incident that happened and it's repeatedly happened actually uh, once I had told this story and a ghost story uh, and after all the group of children went off for their break, one girl remained behind and she said, is, are these stories true? Which is a common question kids ask. And I said, what do you think? And she said, well, the ghost story was definitely not. But the one about where the bhavi gets beaten, that's definitely true. And she said it with great surety. She was about 12 years old. I said, how can you be so sure that that was a true story? And she looked at me and she said, because the same thing happens in my home. By which time a lot of children had come back and many said that, yes, this was happening in their homes as well, or they knew some homes where it was happening, whether they were relatives or neighbors. And so we started talking, what do you feel? The openness of that discussion was stunning. Uh, some of the boys said that, well, when I grow up, uh, you know, maybe just now I can't do anything. I can't do what the boy in the story did because But in a story, maybe I can't do that. I, I, it can happen in a story, but I can't do it in real life. Uh, so he says, but when I grow up and get married and I'm angry with my wife, I'll fight with her, but I won't hit her. That's what I can do. And the girl said, what we can do is we will refuse to get hit. Um, 
But when I've seen, when I've been telling this story, often that question comes up, why didn't she leave? Right, a common question again. Why don't you leave? Why doesn't the woman leave? And so I thought, I, and I also saw in the group always, there were some kids who would just shrivel up because they were hearing their own story. So in this book called uh, Like Smoke, which is the book which won the Sahitya Academy Award, there's a story called Hearing My Own Story where, uh, where they're talking about domestic violence. Uh, there's been a big incident reported in the papers and all of that. And um, this girl and the teacher and how they are hearing their own story. So in lockdown, I don't know. I think these are facts that are going to come out. It's something that we're fearing. Um, I don't know, but I think that empowering children through stories is a very, very important thing to do. Uh, those kids who came forward, that girl who came forward and said, it happens in my house. If you had asked in a classroom of children, is there domestic violence in your house? Of course, they would say no. But if it's through the safety net of a story, then they can talk about uh, that which is difficult otherwise. That's a very interesting perspective. I think there are lots of conversations kids can't have with their parents. Um, and you earlier mentioned also that some of your books have been received very differently from adults in some cases. Um, schools sort of not being very open to having them included in coursework. What's been your, do you think there's a difference in response that parents have to what is permissible to kids and how kids look at what should be permissible to them? I remember being banned from reading certain books by my older sister. And then I realized that um, you need to have those conversations. So what's right. been your experience? Um, Absolutely. And I wouldn't say parents, I would say gatekeepers, because there are the gatekeepers who say this book cannot be, um, cannot be uh, read by my child. Just recently, a very wonderful friend of mine uh, said that she couldn't give a book of mine, uh, this and the other, uh, where they, which has a story of a boy who comes out of the closet as transgender. And uh, she said, I can't share it with my 12 year old grandson, because he doesn't know about this yet. And I said, he knows. He, he's not talking to you about it, but he's talking about it. And uh, she went home and during the conversation, uh, the, the grandson very casually said, of course not Nani, he was gay, that's why. And she read it, oh, he knows. So I think that the gatekeepers kind of are wary of these books because they don't know how they're going to handle the questions that will follow. Um, and so it's better to ban the or, or sort of stop your child from reading. But I think it's, it's important that these stories and through stories for these conversations to happen with a responsible and sensitive uh, adult uh, rather than, uh, you know, because they're getting this information through television, through films. And it's very strange that schools and parents are very uh, all right with children reading um, very violent content, uh, content um, if it comes from the West or even explicit sexual content from the West, they're somehow very wary if it's Indian. That's when they get worried. And it's horrible that my books get gatekeepered, uh, not because of violence, but because of love and sex. Violence and death are easier for parents to deal with or gatekeepers to deal with than death and violence, uh, uh, than uh, love and sex. Isn't that just horrible? Surely it should be the other way around. That's very interesting insight. Um, but it's a conversation a lot of parents are very weary of having with their kids. I think sex is probably one of the most taboo subjects in Indian households. Do you have any tips on how parents should deal with that? Or any thoughts or any book that you'd recommend for parents? 
Um, I, you know, honestly, for me, it's true stories. And I can give an example of a book that my daughter got through a friend of mine. Uh, I hadn't read the book. I think she chose it because it was the biggest, thickest book. She wanted to irritate her younger brother who couldn't read yet. And so she's reading it. She was about nine or 10 years old. And she said to me, she said, Mama, you don't read this book. So I said, why? And she said, because I'll be very embarrassed to know that you've read it uh, and you'll know I've read it. So I said, okay. Uh, and then after halfway through, she said, Mama, read this book. So I said, why? And she said, because there's some questions that I have to ask, but I can't ask them until you've read it. I was sitting with her when she finished reading the book. And she shut it. She was. I think we've lost Paru briefly again. Yeah. Paru, we've lost you. We're just going to wait for another moment um, for Paro to get back. Uh, we've been left at a cliffhanger of a story right now. Okay, am I back again? Yes, your audio is back. I think your video should be back in about a second. Yes, so uh, we heard you and you left us at a crucial moment. Uh, your daughter had just shut her book when we lost you. And you were sitting next to her when she was done with it. Paro, you're on mute also. Yes. Um, so I was with my daughter. She shut the book and she said, Mama, you must read the book. And I said, why? And she said, because it's a very important book. So of course, I was dying to read it, started immediately. Uh, I, I thought it would be a relationship. There'd be a boy and girl who kiss. And to my horror at that time, she was nine or 10 years old. It was a relationship between a boy and an older man. And it was quite explicit. And I was horrified and I'm dreading the questions she's going to ask. And like a laser, she's like focused on me while I'm reading it. And I'm dreading, oh, what is she going to ask? How am I going to answer? And so I said, okay, what were your questions? And she said, I have just one question. I said, okay, um, sweating bullets. And she said, they just loved each other. Why was society so angry? I burst into tears. She was pre-prejudice. She got the book when she didn't know anything about LGBTQ or anything. So she grew up without prejudice, which to me was amazing. When would I have thought as a parent that she can read this book about, uh, it, it wasn't pornography, it was very sensitively and beautifully written, but it was very clearly a sexual and deep relationship between these two men. And um, when would I have thought when she was, 14, 15, too late. That's a really interesting story um, and a very personal one. I also hear you're going to be a grandmother soon or you Yes, are... I am. <laughs> We're hopefully going to have four babies this year. <laughs> oh, wow. So either a lot more writing needs to be done or a lot little is going to happen. <laughs> I feel it's pure writing now. <laughs> so we have a lot of questions coming in uh, for you and for all the others as well. So I think we will move into the question and answer session and sort of continue our conversation, but with the larger group that's been equally uh, excitedly listening to your um, story and conversation. All right, so I think uh, we have everybody on gallery view and I think all of us are visible. Um, we've been getting questions and if you still have more questions, please keep sending them in. Uh, we have a question for Mandovi. Um, 
given your new project, what are some ways that you think the future of storytelling will be? Uh, disseminating stories to kids, say five years from now. And what are your thoughts? Uh, so I think we'll start with that question. So it's a big question. <laughs> Um, you know, I think uh, with Appalam, something really interesting has come uh, sort of, it's bubbled up to the surface, which is that there's a really great way now, uh, there's a lot of wisdom in our past that can be married into like the technology of our future and just talking about um, what we did currently, uh, we use a format that everyone for the last five years has been using. Of course, during lockdown, it's been accelerated even more, you know, talking into your camera and recording yourself and using video as a storytelling format. But it's really just an extension of oral storytelling that we have all grown up with. And, uh, you know, every single person in the audience over here has, has a storyteller in their family who they remember. And I've realized that that's true, no matter which contributor we speak to. And, uh, What's really interesting is that we chose to focus on updating our generation, a new generation with old stories in many ways um, and told in these languages of, uh, you know, their own languages, which have an emotional landscape of their own. So I think uh, one of the things, uh, this isn't necessarily dissemination, whatever the technology is uh, that comes up. So since someone has like raised this towards the future, it can always, it's, it really doesn't matter what the, the format is and what the medium is, but how we kind of apply, uh, what thinking we apply to that does matter. So it's how you wield it. And uh, there's a lot of people who kind of came to us uh, with, there's a really great example from Appalam, which just went up two days ago, which is a dear friend of mine, Smriti actually, who took an old Marwari story that her grandmother used to tell her. And while and she used to hear it in Marwari, and so she's translated it into Hindi. One, uh, and what she did is because the original story had a slightly, uh, it had a, it, it had an end that she wasn't feeling the message anymore. You know, it's it's about two mice, a girl mouse and a boy mouse, and after the boy mouse hits her for wetting the bed. You know, she's stand, sitting, standing outside and very upset. And uh, the, the male mouse keeps coming as he, you know, his domestic chores keep piling up. And he keeps asking, uh, you know, asking her, okay, can you come and help me make the tea? And she says, no, you've hit me. So now I'm very upset and I won't come back. And in the original version that her grandmother used to tell her, in the end, the, the male mouse gives her a laddu and she forgets everything and she goes back. But she has kind of updated that, which I thought is such a lovely way that we don't have to lose the stories of our past, but we can kind of update it uh, with new kind of nuance, which is more applicable to the messages that we want to send. And uh, she's changed it to a very heartfelt, meaningful apology from the, from the boy mask to the girl who finally forgets him after having realized that it's genuine. And, you know, that's how it ends instead. Uh, so one of like the main takeaway, I think, is I would really like to see a lot more translation happen between uh, languages in general. It helps us to relate to each other. And I think nobody speaks better on this topic than Jerry Pinto. And there's plenty of, you know, uh, his uh, thinking on this subject out there. But I feel that uh, if we are able to kind of bring a lot more of those uh, stories out and try and do a lot more exchange between those places, and then use the technology that we have at our disposal to create new formats and be innovative with that. Uh, it's a really, it's a good framework of thinking to apply to the situation. I hope that answers the question. It really does. And that answers another question that we had is what more would you like to see off from children's literature? So I think a lot more translation and a lot of other points that you mentioned sort of cover that up. Uh, quickly moving to Lakshmi and some questions that we've had from, for her. Uh, there have been some art related questions. So how do you think stories of art can inspire more young children to pursue it? Could we see this storytelling be a pathway for the revival of classic arts is one question. And we have another question around any regional progressive content that you can recommend. Um, so, uh, you know, one thing that I didn't talk about in our book, uh, The Dot That Went For A Walk, is that art was a very large component uh, of the book. 
So what we did was, uh, you know, given that I run an art gallery, we invited 51 women artists to do an artwork or illustration for each of the role models. So I, we believe that art is extremely important, you know, and something that, you know, kids should be aware of. Um, uh, so um, th the reason why we did that and, um, and just to back up, so 51 women artists who did an artwork illustration for each of the role models, Pe women used different mediums. Uh, there was uh, Dia Bhopal who used paper to represent a woman. Uh, there was fabric, there was oils, colors, you know, illustrations, you name the different types of medium, it was included. And why we thought art was important is that, you know, we live in a concrete jungle, right? Um, we do not have public art. Um, we don't really, there aren't that many museums that we go to. Um, we don't, um, um, uh, you know, galleries are not something that we take our children to. Uh, at least when we, when I was growing up, I hardly went to any gallery or I, you know, I didn't know much about art. Um, fortunately, my mother started an art gallery and that's how, you know, my, um, I really got involved uh, in the creative space. Um, so, you know, the biggest question, and for me, this was a very important aspect and my biggest contribution to the book is the art, uh, art element. Um, how is it that, you know, the aesthetic sensibilities of the next generation will get enhanced? Uh, we talk about um, uh, innovation, we talk about design thinking, but what is the exposure that we are providing to young kids? And unless we really bring that, inculcate that creative element into our children, uh, I believe that, you know, we can't really progress. Innovation cannot really happen. That creativity needs to be built in from day one. And, um, and, and that's why I would encourage, you know, a lot of parents uh, to really look at the arts, uh, whether it is uh, going to a gallery, just let the kids be exposed to that. The reason why we had 51 women artists is that we wanted kids to be exposed to the fact that there are different ways in which you can showcase one role model. There is no one specific way. Um, and so, yes, so, you know, art is an important element. Are there a lot of books that really for children that talk about art? Uh, you know, we have a lot of coloring books and, you know, things like that. Um, but what I have noticed now is that, you know, with the renaissance of really children's literature today, there is a lot of illustrations, a lot of artists that have really come about uh, in helping uh, the, the, you know, the new authors to showcase or, you know, help them narrate their story better. So, you know, everybody, I mean, I would encourage people to really look at that, uh, you know, encourage the children to look at the illustrations, talk to them about, you know, what they feel and how they interpret the stories. Uh, what was your second question? Uh, are there any regional books? Uh, regional progressive content that you can recommend for children. Oh, so, so you know, unfortunately, um, we all grow up uh, reading, talking, everything in English. And um, so, so that was one of the big reasons, um, you know, we were looking for um, uh, regional content and, you know, First of all, it was very difficult for us to connect to that because, you know, we, we didn't know how to read them. Um, but we felt that, you know, these stories had to be translated. And so we worked on translations. Um, so I'm not the best person really to talk about regional content uh, because I'm from Kerala, but I never lived in Kerala. I lived everywhere else. So, you know, which region do I belong to? I, you know, I don't know. I live here in Hyderabad, grew up in Delhi. So, um, so I'm not the best person to talk about regional content really. Uh, but what we are trying to do is that make the book accessible to a lot of uh, readers who are especially uh, who read, um, you know, um, uh, who need these translations. And I would encourage people to translate all your books uh, into regional languages, because otherwise we are again talking about, uh, you know, one section of the society that's actually um, getting the privilege of these stories. A large portion of our, uh, you know, population don't. Yes, Paro has something. I, I wanted to add that I have been desperately trying to get my books translated. They, they're translated into foreign languages. Uh, but even the National Book Trust, where I work, uh, don't find them appropriate for children. Uh, and so it hasn't been, uh, they haven't been translated. Even the one which won the Sahitya Academy Award, it's been a couple of years. It's supposed to come out in at least 12, 13 languages hasn't yet happened. Uh, now I'm on a fellowship and hopefully the books will be coming in Hindi. 
but otherwise only a couple of my pratham books uh, have have come in the languages it's very hard we self published our book and so we had the opportunity to do to translate and um, and really push this and that was one of the main reasons why we sub we published our books on our own even though uh, self publishing is not the best way to go but i'm just saying that we wanted to make sure that this book reached a larger audience so you know we wanted to make sure the book was low cost um, um really we could give it away for free if we could uh, you know and that's the motivation behind it so i understand from a publisher's perspective there must be a lot of other um things that they have to worry about and it's quite unfortunate paro that your book cannot get translated i wish every kid would have access to these i wish they would because if i tell it in hindi or punjabi um and the children say well, where can we read it and mm. and you such an amazing storyteller oh wow the story you <laughs> read was amazing like i see you and it was really good if i can jump in for a second it would be nice um, you know if it's so, like this difficult to get it translated in written text this is a nice opportunity to use the the oral and the audio and the video format to kind of have people tell these stories who are good with that maybe the sort of resource that needs to go into that is a little bit less and at least it's a start um and in sort of distributing it and if we had better distribution networks in place to make sure that those reached uh, more children in more uh, corners of this country there's nothing like it so it would be a pretty nice solution right and in fact our uh, telugu edition was uh, in 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 a physical form our hindi edition we are trying that we just want it to be available to everybody and so we are trying to make sure that sorry um it's on a um uh, it's it's uh, in an audio format yeah but i can already see some collaborations coming out of this paro i think uh, translation is something clearly everybody is passionate about mandovi has spoken about using audio and i i completely agree that i think translations in local languages should be done and i think we should all stay in touch about this uh, paro last question we have a couple for you and you can um, just to take one or two of these uh, one is about what can we do to get teachers on board um, to sort of talk about these difficult subjects um, and how do we start this sensitization early is one question and the other is a lot of textual material in schools and otherwise uh, sort of reinforce stereotypes is there any change that's happening at a systems level that you've been noticing mm. over the last few years mm. well the second question first uh, je- genuinely there is a change there is a greater sensitivity um there was uh, i think when there was a study done there were two pictures of of women in textbooks of of girls one was where the girl was tying a rakhi so that was necessary to have a girl the second was a silhouette uh, of a woman carrying a tea tray while the men were sitting and having a meeting that has definitely changed and i think generally the world of children's books is much greater um i mean a lot of progression in the kind of subjects in the gender sensitivity and gender in the widest sense of the word uh so not only talking about um femininity in a different way but masculinity in a different way and also talking about the 16 other genders you know um what can you do to uh get past the gatekeepers uh <laughs> sometimes a little sneakily i have to say uh in my story uh which is in uh, the other there's a story called so cinderella uh, which is told from the point of view of the ugly sisters where the ugly sisters say that it's um it's much easier for a boy to be ugly than for a girl to be ugly the battle is much greater if the girl is ugly uh but in that so how do I, how did i sneak past the first line of the story was uh so cinderella now there's a bitch if you ever need one is what the girl says and the editor says paro no <laughs> it won't get past it won't get into school so i thought yeah it really would so very cleverly we changed it from bitch to witch 
which was fine. But when I tell the story, and the girls, you know, I mean, the kids look and say, you my bitch, right? <laughs> so what is that? Uh, the second is to engage in greater and greater conversation. Um, when my book was banned in one school, it had actually gone already to children and a group of WhatsApp parents got together and created a big shindy and said that they would, th they threatened the school, the principal and all of that. Why? Because there's a Muslim boy and a Hindu girl uh, who exchanged, would you believe it, a small quick kiss in the school and they fall in love. Um, so I said, let me have a conversation with the parents. Let me talk to them, but the, they, the school wouldn't allow it. However, most schools will at least put it into the bookshelf. No child has ever, I've dealt with over three lakh children. Uh, not one child has ever said, this story was not appropriate for us. Um, there's a story uh, called uh, Grief is a Beast about a child who loses her father, uh, her mother. And when I went to a school where they were studying the, the book and I asked them, which of the stories do you want me to do? Uh, and they said, Grief in a, is a Beast. And I was kind of taken aback because I had written it at a time when I was losing my mother. She was slipping away and I wrote it. And I often wondered whether this story should not have been put into this book at all. Was it just like a personal kind of, did I just bung it in there? But that's what the children wanted. And I couldn't read it, I was weeping. And so they said, can we read it for you? And they did such a beautiful rendering of my story on the loss of a mother. Okay. Thanks a lot for sharing that, Paro. And about the ban, I think the most sure shot way of getting children to read something is by telling them not to read it. So I'm sure a lot more kids read it um, after they heard they're not supposed to. Um, so quickly, as we wrap up, we're already at the 5.30 mark. Um, in the podcast, Women in Labor, the last question that's typically asked is, what's the one thing you can do and the, uh, the watchers can or the listeners can do? So for all of us, what's the one book, and very briefly, that you recommend every child needs to read? Uh, we can start with Mandovi. That's such a hard question. <laughs> uh, I'm just going to go with my favorite one growing up, and my sister's as well. It's called The Andaman Boy by Zai Whitaker. And I highly recommend it. It, uh, it gave me so much perspective. I was lucky to grow up uh, with my mother who introduced me to only regional and cultural kind of independent publishing that existed. And it changed uh, my worldview. So uh, I highly recommend this one. I loved it. It's, <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Lakshmi. Hi. Um, as uh, Mandovi said, it's such a tough one. I have like different age groups, different books, you know, that I have in mind. But, um, uh, you know, The Giving Tree uh, is uh, one book um, that I really enjoy, uh, especially because I think of it from a child's perspective. And, um, and, but again, it's Western and, you know, so I come back to, you know, with the bias of, you know, get the dot that went for a walk. <laughs> <laughs> Indian of the giving tree on Upalam, so someone can go and watch that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the end of the day. Impossible question because everyone's choice is so different. I was I was a terrible reader. I came from a family of readers, but I hated reading till I was twelve years old. Until I found the one book that changed, literally changed my life, which was. Born Free by Joy Adams, uh, but that's what changed my life. Uh, right now, my current favorite is a book called Fly Away Boy uh, by Jane D'Souza Gopalakrishnan. It's stunning. It's about being different. It's about not fitting in. It's like uh, a tare. It's like the little tare is a mean bird kind of. It's beautiful. It's so funny, it's so light, yet it's on such an important thing. Yeah, fly away, boy. So 
That's great. Thanks a lot. Thanks to all the speakers, all three of you. It's been such a personal pleasure for me to hear from all of you. Um, a big thank you again to America Center for hosting us. A big thank you to Women in Labor and to Wild City for organizing this event and just allowing us to be together. Um, thanks a lot, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for doing this.